about kind of uh, microphones, the different types and their best use cases. And C, talk about uh, like other uh, environmental factors that can impact your recording, such as where you record, what you're recording, and how you choose your microphone for that application. So what are we going to learn today? Well, first and foremost is how to capture professional sounding audio with your camera. We're going to learn what the different types of microphones are, how to pick the best microphone for your application, what camera settings to use, because let's face it, it can be a little bit confusing at times. Uh, as I mentioned, learning about the environmental, factors that uh, environmental factors that can impact your recording, and how to process and edit and enhance your audio in post once you've made a perfect recording. So first things first. Just let that sink in a second. I don't know if everyone will agree, but it is true when it comes to video, sound is more important than picture. Now, you can't hear me now. It's not as engaging. I look good, I think, but you can't hear me. The sound is more important than the picture. And why is that? Well, let's take a, a kind of very crass overview. If you go onto a YouTube video where, you know, it's kind of 360p quality, but, you know, it sounds really good. You can get the general idea of what's going on in the video, but it sounds really good. You may still engage and watch that. You know, a lot of the videos from, you know, the early 2000s that are up online, really bad video quality, but we still watch them because they sound good. So, it's easy to describe what good sound sounds like. Um, I think you'd all be comfortable in saying everything that you're watching on Netflix or BBC or Sky or whatever has got good sound. You know, you don't get anything into that caliber of a network with bad sound. But it's difficult to describe what bad sound sounds like. We're all very used to very polished, high quality broadcast recordings. But what does bad sound sound like? Well too quiet you know how annoying is it when you're on again YouTube and you're skipping between videos and the levels are jumping all around the world and you know something that's too quiet something that's too loud too distorted it can be quite annoying uh, another factor is windy so how bad does that sound you know you've got to avoid that kind of stuff how do you avoid that kind of stuff we'll get onto that Thin and lacking in detail is something that I can't really show you here, but there's uh, a good example of that is something that sounds like it's really distant. You know, you might have got not got close enough to the subject that you're trying to record. Uh, that could result in something that sounds, A, too quiet, uh, and B, it's lacking detail. You can't make out the plosives, which is the p -s -t -k that's in someone's voice. If you can't make out those plosives, then you can't necessarily make out what someone's talking about. Boomy and roomy, uh, this is something that we'll cover uh, when we're talking about where you record matters. So something that's boomy, it could be that the room is resonating in a certain way and it's imparting, your, uh, imparting some sort of like resonant audio characteristics onto your recording. And roomy, I mean, you can definitely hear the sound of a room in a bad recording. You know, if, some, if you're on a Teams call and someone's using their laptop mic, you can hear the room for sure. And the difference when they go onto something like a headset and they've got a microphone like this is totally night and day. So boomy and roomy, a very important factor as well. So let's go through these. Let's fix these issues. Most of what I'm going to talk about here is going to be referring to cameras, but uh, everything here that I'm talking about can be inferred on any audio job that you might be doing, whether that's kind of uh, voiceover, foley work, um, you know, working with uh, an iOS device or a smartphone, something like that. But just because I'm at a camera show, I'm going to give you the rundown of why most cameras don't sound great. So first things first is very small, non-directional microphones. So, um, sorry, Canon, but on this example here, where do you think the microphone is on that camera, if you had to guess? It's those tiny three dots uh, where the microphone is in that camera. It's the size of a P, <laughs> the thing in that. Uh, and the reason that matters is because the smaller the mic and the flatter the mic, the less range it has and the less uh, detail it will be able to capture. They have uh, a narrow frequency response. So uh, how I can uh, best describe that in a kind of photography ma uh, means is that instead of having a full frame of a, of a shot, you can see this much of 
the audio. You cannot capture uh, the, the, the full range of the audio that you're trying to record. Generally speaking, cameras tend to have poor audio circuitry. You know, it's a camera. It's meant for capturing photos and video. Audio is generally an afterthought for a lot of manufacturers. They are getting better, but they're still not quite there. So they tend to have uh, what I would describe as poor audio circuitry, so underpowered preamps or noisy components. I'm sure you guys have all tried to shoot something on your DSLR without a microphone attached, and it sounds like everything's a million miles away and going <laughs> in the background. That's exactly what we're trying to avoid. And I mention that because no wind protection. It's impossible to get wind protection over something that small. So if you're already bored, <laughs> I'm going to give you a very, very crass, very generalized oversimplification of how to get good audio. You can read these next 15 words, and then you are free to leave if you wish, because you will have all the knowledge that you will need. Buy the best microphone you can afford. Buy the best microphone you can afford and get it as close as you can. That is audio for film 101, strictly speaking. That is the basis of everything we're, we're going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. Now, I should note, uh, uh, as part of this, you should buy the best microphone you can afford, preferably with a Rode logo, if you can. That would be great. Um, get it as close as you can, and also get it as loud as you can. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you want to be distorting what you're recording, but the louder you're recording and the closer you get it, the more detail you'll have to work with after. It's like uh, capturing in RAW. You know, you capture something in RAW and then you've got all that dynamic range that you can play with. Uh, same goes for audio. The louder, the more dynamic range you have in the audio recording, the more you can do in post. So I'm just going to give you a quick generalization. Uh, um, there's many, many more microphone types than this. Many, many hundreds more of microphone types like this. I actually have one that's uh, used for uh, geothermal uh, uh, reconnaissance. And I actually use it to record the resonance of bridges and structural uh, engineering things. Very weird, but just to say, there's more microphones than just these. But these are the most common ones that you're going to be using for your kind of DSLR or uh, you know, your kind of videography uh, kind of work. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of uh, each type of microphone and what they're good for, what they're not good for, and um, why you would potentially pick one of these for your project. First up is the shotgun. So this is uh, a mic that you're probably all very familiar with. I'm sure we've all seen these red things on top of cameras, even at the show. Um, you know, this is the most common type of microphone you're going to see on top of a camera. So this is called a shotgun. Uh, I think you can probably guess why it's called a shotgun, because it looks like the barrel of a shotgun. That is exactly why. Now, shotgun mics uh, are really, really, really good for a few different things. Um, particularly good for uh, dialogue, uh, and especially if you want to capture a little bit of room sound within that dialogue. Very, very good for that. Um, they are one channel, okay? So uh, imagine you've only got one ear. That's how it's going to record. That's how it's going to sound in headphones. It's going to sound mono. So it's going to pick up directly down the middle of what you're pointing it at. And that's good. Um, they have very strong directionality. So with a shotgun mic, um, what you're pointing it at is what it's going to record. Now, I had a gentleman uh, on our stand yesterday saying, I was uh, filming someone, um, but the audio didn't sound good. And I said, well, where were you pointing the microphone? He said, oh, it was over there. But I was filming here. I was like, well, of course it's not going to sound good because you're not pointing the microphone at the thing. It seems like, how on earth did you think that was going to work? But, you know, it does happen. Uh, so shotgun mics have very strong directionality. And the length of the microphone defines the range. And that's an important thing to note. So the longer the mic, the further I can pick up, you know, one of you in the crowd with my camera if I wanted to. Um, and it effectively gives it more range. So uh, a mic this long, you know, I'd be able to pick up. You ladies at the back there, uh, fairly well. But we, know, um, we make a, a shotgun mic called the NTG8, which looks like a lightsaber. 
and that's actually used for kind of bird washing applications and that kind of thing. If you want to pick up a barn owl in the corner of a room a half a mile away, that kind of thing, they do exist. Um, so the length matters, uh, and it depends on the project, but it effectively uh, gives you uh, a ruler. Imagine you've got a ruler coming out the front of your camera, and what you're pointing it at is what it's going to record. They reject off-axis sounds, so what that means is it's not going to pick up anything to the left and right of it. If I was pointing it straight at this camera down the middle, it would only pick up what I'm pointing it at there. Um, as I say, there's many, many models and options, not just road. You know, the shotgun mic has been around forever, but the road ones are the best. Um, but there's, there's many, many options out there that do a lot of different things. So the shotgun mic, traditionally, uh, you wouldn't traditionally see them on camera particularly. Uh, they're more done, you see them on the end of booms, like boom operators, that kind of thing. But you are starting to see them on camera now because they are really good for that kind of dialogue capture, that kind of thing. Um, I mentioned that some have multiple applications. Uh, just within the road catalog, we have some that are USB microphones. They have onboard noise cancellation, DSP, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, do, do a lot of research into what you're going to be shooting, number one. Um, think about the range you're going to need. Um, and uh, yeah, and think about uh, what fu extra functionality you might need as well. The other type of mic that I'm going to talk about is a stereo mic. So stereo mics are a particular favorite of mine. So a stereo microphone is uh, effectively two uh, capsules arranged in what's called an XY configuration. Now an XY configuration emulates what the human ears are doing. Okay, So you can imagine if I wanted to record the sound of this room, if I had a shotgun microphone and I was pointing at you guys, I would record be recording you. But if I wanted to capture the whole ambience of this space that we're in right now, a stereo microphone would be perfect for that. Now, it doesn't have the same range as a shotgun mic. You're not able to kind of pinpoint in on what you want to record. But it does definitely capture room tones a lot better. Um, generally speaking, kind of Foley work, that kind of thing, if anyone's ever done this before, um, have you heard about recording room tones? Does anyone put your hand up if you know what recording room tone is? Okay, so um, what, ha what tends to happen in some kind of filming applications is you'll record something with like the Lavalier mics or the shotgun mic, as I mentioned a minute ago, but it'll tend to sound kind of uh, sterile because you've recorded something very precisely. Uh, and you'll get it into post and it will sound, this was almost, it almost sounds like it's recorded in a vacuum. What stereo mics are really good for is that you can place them in a room in complete silence, but they will still capture the general ambience and tone of that room. So you're recording silence, silence, uh, that you then lay into that more sterile recording in post. And effectively what it does is it makes it that more sterile recording sound more realistic. So stereo microphones are really good for those sorts of applications. Not particularly good for you know capturing dialogue, as I say. Um, they're kind of good for um, interviews if you've got someone on either side. Um, there's a guy that we work with that, d that does podcasts with a stereo mic, and he actually pans himself left and the guest right on his YouTube channel. So when you're listening to it in headphones and you're watching it, it sounds like they're in the room because they're talking from either side of the room. It's, it's really quite clever. You can do a lot of clever stuff with stereo mics. They're, they're really good for special effects as well. If you're doing sort of like any uh, kind of sound design stuff, uh, potentially, you know, video game things or, or movies, soundscapes or that kind of thing, really good for special effects as well. And then the, uh, the, the last one I'm going to talk about here is uh, Lavalier's. Um, I've got the, the wireless goes uh, in as part of this. So the wireless goes, I'm sure you're all familiar with these. These are little wireless microphones that we do. Uh, that also have a built-in Lavalier, so I've put them in the Lavalier category. Lavalier microphones are absolutely the golden, golden ticket for getting good audio because you can't get any closer than there on someone. They are easily concealed. They have a short pickup distance, so they're not going to pick up all of the room sound and all of that kind of stuff. It rejects a lot of off-axis sound. So if you are recording someone with a Lavalier and they're in a room and there's sounds coming from the left and right, it won't get in, into the capsule. 
They tend to be non-obtrusive. This is not a Lavalier, but it's sort of obtrusive. It's stuck on my head, but you know, you know the ones I'm talking about, the one that will clip to your shirt, that kind of thing. And uh, you can get them, uh, generally speaking, you can get them pretty loud as well, Lavaliers. But the reason things like shotgun mics exist is if you're filming, let's say you're doing the next Avengers film, because you're all those high quality Hollywood directors that I see here. Um, <laughs> You can't have a Lavalier microphone on Iron Man. That's not going to look the part. So that's why things like shotgun microphones exist. But for dialogue, presentations, uh, you know, vlogs, um, even for voiceover, these are the sort of golden ticket for getting great sounding audio. So uh, a little bit on uh, cameras in particular um, and getting the settings right now. This is an oversimplification, uh, a bit of a generalization, because all um, cameras are very, very different in how they handle their audio. Um, and getting the settings right is absolutely crucial uh, to capturing good audio for your video projects. So um, one thing you should do uh, when using the external microphone, um, the Rode microphones feature something called a mic boost. Uh, other options are available. Um, but uh, what a mic boost will do is it will boost the output of the microphone itself without having to rely on the circuitry of your camera. So as I mentioned earlier, generally speaking, the audio circuitry of your camera is not going to be powerful enough to give you the amount of gain that you want, the level that you want to get your microphone loud. So use the mic boost functionality in the microphones. That is using the preamp inside of the microphone. It's going to get that mic really, really loud to a good standard of loud. Um, and also uh, it means you're not having to rely on your camera's settings. Strictly speaking, you want to try and keep the recording level or the gain level in your camera as low as possible. Um, a lot of cameras, if you have it on zero, it mutes the input completely. So uh, generally speaking, one with uh, a mic boost applied on the microphone itself is going to be enough. Now, there is an antithesis to this. Um, if your microphone is too loud <laughs> and uh, the preamps in your camera are too loud, a lot of our microphones also feature something called a pad. And the pad will do the opposite to a boost. It will bring the level down within the camera, and that's an analog cut and an analog boost. So it's not adding digital gain or artifacts or anything like that. So you've got boosting, and you've got the opposite of boosting. Those are two very, very useful things that you need to understand, because too loud, it's going to get distorted. Too quiet, it's going to be thin and lacking detail, as I spoke about earlier. Now, HP filter, I should probably uh, apply a a bit of explanation to that. That stands for high pass filter. Uh, these are a very useful tools in a lot of different applications. So if I was interviewing someone, let's say, you know, in a, in a conference room or something where there's a, a noisy air con in the background that's, you know, not particularly loud, but it's still noticeable in the recording or, or when we're doing our tests, a high pass filter will remove that low frequency energy from the audio. So it effectively takes out the uh, offensive frequencies and cleans up your input audio. Very, very handy feature. It's uh, recording environment specific, but it's very important that you understand its application. It's also very useful for people that tend to have very boomy voices. So um, name drop, I did some work with Brian Blessed a few years ago. And as you all know, he's got a voice like this. And it's incredibly bassy. Like, and we were doing an audio book. And I was like, oh my god, I can't listen to you for eight hours. You are too loud. Um, but what I ended up doing was actually putting a little bit of a high pass filter on his voice. And it completely changed the way it sounded for all of us. It was not fatiguing anymore. He could shout. He could uh, exert himself. <laughs> And uh, it was, yeah, it just made the whole process a lot nicer and the, uh, the final recordings a lot more cleaner. Uh, some cameras do have some special features. Um, so, yeah, a bad special feature is AGC, which is auto gain control. 
Now, auto gain control, you should absolutely 155 million percent turn off in your camera the second you get it. For me, that is the first thing I turn off when I get a new camera, straight away. What AGC does is it is uh, riding the level of your gain. So when you're talking, it brings the level up to the appropriate level. And as soon as you stop talking, the level will go down and then it will raise it up again because it's not receiving any audio. And what that does is it will just go, your talking sounds good, but during the quiet parts, it's going in the background. It creates this kind of wishy-washy sort of tonality uh, and, and quality to your recordings. And uh, you can hear it a mile away. You can hear it an absolute mile away. And for someone like me that's sensitive to that kind of thing, it's like playing a duff note on a piano for me. I'm just like, oh, God, oh, I can hear it. I don't like it. Um, absolutely turn that off. Uh, you do not need uh, automatic gain control when using an external microphone, provided <laughs> you understand how the levels work. So in this example here, you can see that we have something called a, a dB meter or a VU meter at the bottom of the camera, that blue box there. That is where you can monitor the levels of audio coming into your camera. This is absolutely the most important thing I'm going to explain to you here. Never, ever, ever go into the red on these things, ever. Because when you're going into the red, that is going to be clipping. And what clipping is, is when the sound pressure or the energy is too loud for the internal circuitry of the camera, so it overloads. And it distorts. It distorts, okay? It does exactly that, okay? You want to stay completely away from that. The best place to be with your levels is, uh, generally speaking, these level bars will have uh, either a green, yellow, or red. You want to be tickling the yellow. That is the best way to, uh, to be uh, recording your audio, is get hitting the yellow, going nowhere into the red. And if you are doing some video shoots, um, and you can attach, let's say, an external monitor that will also let you monitor uh, the audio outs, that is absolutely imperative to be watching that throughout the project. There's been some live streams I've done where we've done the test run, been filming, it's like, ah, oh, sounds great, absolutely wicked. Um, and we get halfway through the live stream and I've noticed that <laughs> it sounds like that the whole time because I've not paid attention to the levels and made adjustments since everyone's getting more excited and a bit louder and a bit more comfortable. You have to absolutely keep an eye on that, absolutely. And the next thing I'd say is work backwards. So what I mean by that is, if I was recording yourself, I would analyze the environment we're in, I would pick the right microphone, and I would work backwards to the camera. So make sure, get your level, get the level of the microphone right, get the level in the camera right, and then watch those VU meters. It's very often that people will just go, oh, I've set the camera, plop, 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 and they'll work that way. You should always work from the audio source backwards, absolutely 100% of the time. Because uh, you will run into issues if you go the other way around. You'll have to adjust at different stages. So maybe you're adjusting the camera's gain when you've already done a take or something like that. You've got to just work backwards. That's the best way to do it. So environmental considerations. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is just a, a few different factors that you need to consider when recording. Okay, and the most annoying environmental factor for anyone that records audio, whether it's for video or someone like myself that does like a lot of Foley work or location recording, is wind. Wind is impossible to deal with completely. Uh, the reason that wind is annoying is because it's a high intensity energy uh, that can cause, well, you all know what it sounds like. It sounds like that. You want to avoid that. So the way that you can avoid wind would you believe it? Record indoors. Duh. Um, number two, if you do need to record on location or in the field, use the windshields that come with the microphones. There are two different types. There's a kind of foam one like this. This is called a cell windshield. 
Uh, and there's also what we, I hate the name, I hate saying this out loud, a dead cat. Have you seen a dead cat? Looks like a dead cat. I hate that name so much. But that's what you see on that picture there, that furry thing. Now, the furries are really, really, really good at rejecting wind noise. They're not perfect, but they're very, very, very good at it. What they do is effectively dissipate the energy before it hits the capsule of the microphone. Okay? So they are a very good way of dealing with uh, wind. Okay? The cell um, foam shields I'm talking about, these ones like this one on here, the little one there or that's in that picture at the bottom there, they're really good for indoors. Okay? So uh, always keep those on. They're very inert. They don't tend to do anything to your audio. But what the furry windshields or the dead cats will do, you know, full disclosure, they will cut away some of your high frequency content in your recordings. So you may lose a little bit of detail as a result, but a lot of Rode microphones do have a high frequency boost. So if you do put that uh, furry on and you find that your recording is lacking a bit of detail, pop that on and it should fix the problem for you. So wind is the arch enemy of all audio recordists. It is the bane of my existence. I hate it, but it's an essential evil. Rooms are a very important consideration. So uh, I was talking about recordings being boomy or roomy. Where you're recording matters almost as much as what you're recording. So if you're in, let's say, a tiled bathroom and you're recording something, it's going to sound really echoey, isn't it? You know, the sound is going to be slapping around that room uh, and it's going to sound really reverberant. So reverberant is, uh, as you can hear, my voice bouncing off the walls over there. That's, that echo is reverb. You want to try and avoid that because it, you know, you're not doing a, a presentation to camera like this. You know, you might be doing dialogue. You want to try and remove that from the, uh, uh, as a factor of your room. Now, there's ways you can do that. You can do it with acoustic treatment if you want to be really uh, posh, if you want to be uh, rough and ready, <laughs> mattresses will <laughs> put a mattress up against the wall and try and find out where the problem area of your room is, where the echo might be. A mattress, a sofa, anything dense, even human bodies will make a big difference in the space that you're recording. If you can record in a room with a lot of people that can be quiet, <laughs> They, uh, the human body will absorb a lot of sound energy and reduce that echo in the room. Um, a good example of that is if we moved everything out of this room and I was still doing this talk, the echo would be about 50% worse. You would hear it probably twice before it got back to you. So yeah, acoustic treatment. You can use duvets, you can hang them over doors, you know, that kind of thing. Try and get rid of that echo as much as you can, especially if you're using a shotgun mic, because they tend to be very, very sensitive to uh, that returning echo from, uh, from your recorded source. The position, uh, this, is, this is very, very important. So uh, I said in my oversimplification, buy the best microphone you can and get it as close as you can. That feeds into position. Can you get close? Can you use a lavalier, which we said is the gold standard of dialogue recording? If you can't, can you use a shotgun? Can that shotgun be on a boom? Can it be, you know, can it be uh, a, a stereo microphone to record ambience? What is the position relative to where you're recording? It's very important that you consider your shot first if you're doing video, and then whilst you're considering that shot, you have to absolutely think about how you're gonna get the audio equipment in there. Uh, it's been quite often that I've been doing kind of uh, video takes or interviews and that kind of thing. And um, I've had shotgun microphones on the floor pointing at the people that are talking and they're in shot. And I was like, ah, oh, I didn't want them in shot. So then you have to crop it out and then you lose the table in the shot, that kind of thing. Do be thinking about where you're going to position your audio gear relative to where you need to get the best quality recordings. Positioning is absolutely everything. And that also feeds into the source, so what you're recording as well. So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, if you're recording dialogue, the holy grail is a Lavalier mic. You cannot get any closer or louder than having something on someone's shirt. Uh, if you're recording um, like a band or a performance or something like that, generally speaking, 
Uh, as I say, stereo microphones are going to be very, very good for that. Um, but yeah, what you're recording, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday that records seascapes. So he'll record like uh, the sound of the sea and the beach and do videos to, to look like nice music, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, he was getting his microphone on a boom pole that was somehow, I think he sellotaped several together, that was 25 meters. So to give you, how long's this hole? About 40 meters, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. So he had a boom pole almost <laughs> the length of this room to record the sound of breaking waves. Now, I don't know how he's done that. <laughs> I've no idea how he's done that. But those are the lengths that people will go to to record the source they're trying to get to. So the source is very, very important. You could be lucky enough to be filming uh, the F1. You know, I've, I actually have a friend that does that. Uh, and he's had to buy a completely new range of specialized microphones from us uh, to record Formula One cars because it's so loud that the uh, he's had to invest in special microphones to be able to do this. Um, so yeah, he's had to do that because what he's recording is incredibly loud. What you're recording really, really matters. So that definitely uh, leans into the equipment choice. Um, you know, it, it's absolutely everything. So handling noise, this is an important one. Um, I was talking about Lavalier's being the, the kind of gold standard for, for recording uh, voice o uh, for recording dialogue. They can ruffle on shirts. I'm sure you've all seen people stomp off set on BBC News or something like that, and they get that <laughs> as they take it off. Um, a particularly annoying thing for uh, wedding videographers is the bride's dress flapping over the Lavalier mic, and it's it sounds like this, and it's really distant, and it doesn't sound very good. That's a thing you want to try and avoid. So handling noise is also this. It's called um, microphonic handling noise. So, you know, when you have a microphone in your hand and you hit it into your other hand, you'll hear it. Handling noise is a, an absolute no-no. Uh, so you want to try and avoid that as much as you can. So Lavaliers are good. They're great. They're fantastic. But they can suffer from that kind of shirt rustling or that kind of, you know, that kind of it, people that want to be moving. They're not great for that kind of thing. So do be thinking about handling noise. That feeds into the position, as I was talking about as well. Can you get close? Do you have to think about that? Um, but my favorite little kind of life hack um, that I'm going to uh, bestow upon you is uh, if you can, if you can, you know, if you're doing voiceover for something um, or, you know, something that doesn't require you to be on camera, record in your car. Because a car is effectively a portable recording studio booth on wheels. Um, they sound absolutely fantastic. I've done a, a ton of uh, voiceover work uh, in the past um, where I've recorded in the car and it sounds bloody fantastic. <laughs> it sounds better than what I've been able to do in proper recording studios um, because they're incredibly well insulated. They're actually uh, isolated from the floor as well. You know, you're, you're not going to get sort of any kind of resonance or anything like that. Um, you know, granted, it's quite difficult to get all your gear in the car, but yeah, uh, that is what I would suggest. If you can, record in your car, record in your car. Also, something else that feeds into that, if you are wanting to record a voiceover, um, but you don't need to kind of capture the uh, capture film at the same time, you can actually use your camera as an audio recorder, believe it or not. Really simple thing to do. Put your lens cap on, plug in a microphone, and just record your voiceover into the camera and just use it as an audio recorder. And then you can just drop that into post and then just cut out the video part. And then you've got a really good bit of voice over there. Something I do all the time because I, I don't want to be carrying around a, a portable recorder all the time. Can't believe how many times I've done this. Honestly, don't forget to press that red button because I do that all the time. It's really annoying. Seriously, really, really annoying. Uh, if I can give you one bit of advice, that, <laughs> like the amount of times I've, I was like, oh, yeah, smash that presentation. Oh, I did really good. I was like, 
oh, camera's off, or I've not pre or, or something. It is so important that you do press <laughs> record. I feel that's just from my uh, personal experiences. I forgot to do that kind of thing so many times. So what to do after you've recorded? Um, it's very important that you uh, obviously listen uh, to what you've recorded. You watch what you've recorded. Um, make sure you're syncing everything up. Uh, Premiere's got some absolutely fantastic tools now, like the auto clap sync is absolutely fantastic. So make sure you do a before you start recording. Really, really handy. Make sure you watch absolutely everything you've recorded. It's been, uh, again, speaking from personal experience, I've done product demonstrations where I filmed a video and I'm like, 10 minutes in, I'm like, ah, yeah, this is great. I've cut out all the silences, all that sort of stuff. And then right at the end, instead of watching the entire thing, I've just gone, ah, that, that last minute will be fine. Turns out, completely muted. Make sure you watch the whole thing that you've recorded. Uh, and if you do get it wrong, make sure you reshoot. Very, very important that you absolutely watch the whole thing that you've done. I'm going to talk uh, uh, very quickly about editing. So uh, editing can be done with a myriad of different of applications. Um, I personally use uh, an audio editing suite called Ableton Live. Uh, this is something that's been around for nearly 25 years. And it's, a, um, it's a for making music, uh, but it has a whole suite of audio uh, editing tools that are sort of... Um, better than anything else, if I'm totally honest. So do make sure that you're using the right tool for the job. So um, Premiere uh, does have some really good audio editing tools, but the uh, what I would class as the special effects, so the EQ, uh, the compression, the denoise, and the de-reverb features aren't quite as good as what you'd find in a professional audio recording suite. So something like Ableton Live, you can get it for about 99 pounds for a really um, kind of restricted version, so you can edit kind of eight to twelve tracks of audio at a time, but that's generally more enough, more than enough for a lot of video projects. Um, the reason I mention Ableton Live again is because the quality of the special effects is a lot higher than what you'll find in something like Premiere. Um, talking about EQ, so equalization um, is effectively <laughs> the audio version of RGB sliders. Is the best way to describe it. So. Um, <laughs> If you want more bass in your recording, you can add bass. If you want l less bass, you can take it away. Um, as I was saying, people with bassier voices, you may want to turn down the bass in their voice. You may have someone that has a very nasal voice and you want to remove the mid-range from their voice. That will open up uh, the, the characteristics or the tone of their voice and make it sound more natural. And then the higher frequency content uh, that you find in EQ, uh, that will actually add a little bit more sparkle and detail to your recordings. Compression is a very, very important uh, uh, effect to understand as well. Effectively, what compression will do is it will equalize the levels of everything in your recording. Used carefully, and I mean very carefully, because you can absolutely destroy a recording with compression. Used carefully, it will ensure that the loudest parts of your mix are the same as the quietest parts of your mix. So it gets everything within this narrow band of perfect levels. Obviously, you don't want the rustle of someone's keys in a video to be the same as their dialogue, but you don't want it to be unheard. So what it will do is it will bring up the level of the quiet bits and it will reduce the level of the loudest bits to this perfect range. It will compress the range. But if you do too much compression, what it will do is it will actually take away the detail and it will make everything sound kind of uh, it, like the P, there's the S, the T's, the punchy parts of the audio will lack their impact. So do be very, very careful with it. Thankfully, a lot of um, audio editing applications have presets. So like, like you have with your filters on whatever social media. So you can just go... Just keep scanning through one until you get one that sounds good. It's super lazy, but it works. Um, same with compression as well. There's usually some sort of preset that you can engage that's going to be male dialogue one, and you click on that and it will make male, ma uh, male dialogue sound good. Uh, the last two things I'm going to talk about uh, in, in regards to editing is denoise and de-reverb. Okay, these are very, very important. Uh, denoising a recording... Uh, used to be impossible about 10 years ago. Um, 
we're now at a point where you can sort of wing it <laughs> with audio and it will probably sound all right. Uh, there's enough kind of special effects and after effects that you can make it sound passable without putting too much skill into it. Uh, and that is because of things like I was saying about the kind of presets with the EQ and compression, but also things like denoise and de-reverb. So even if you've done all of your due diligence, you've gone through absolutely everything in your signal chain, your audio signal chain to the nth degree, you're still going to get some noise in that recording. Okay, now that could be because of the room, the camera, the cables. It could be because of a Wi-Fi hub 50 meters in the other side of the building. Uh, it can happen. Thankfully, um, there's a company called Ozone that make an absolutely fantastic suite of audio editing tools. Uh, and they have one in particular that is this denoising suite. And what it does is you can run your audio through it and you can isolate the noise in your recording and it will remove it like magic, like absolute magic. If I would have said this to my fellow audio engineers 10, 15 years ago, they would have said, nah, it's not possible, not possible. You would have had to reshoot, find the issue on the line, turn off that Wi-Fi up 50 meters away. You would have had to go to the nth degree to, to fix that, but no, there is some very intelligent software that now exists for doing that. It's made by a company called uh, Ozone. The suite's called Isotope. I highly recommend it. It's 79 pounds. It will change your life. They also have uh, something in the same suite called D-Reverb. So uh, if you have put up your mattresses, your blankets, your sofas, you filled the room with people to get rid of that reverb and you've still got that room tone, uh, or you've still got that echo in that reverb, there is actually an algorithm that will remove that as well. You can tune it to the frequency, it's absolutely crazy. You can tune it to the frequency of your room and it will remove the reverb and clean up your recording. It's absolutely magic. So whilst I'm saying that you need to understand these tools with some precision, conversely, you absolutely don't <laughs> at the same time. So uh, just a very, very quick recap of, uh, of today's points. Um, Pick the right mic. So we went through the different types. The shotgun that's highly directional. The stereo mic that will pick up the ambience of the room. And the Lavalier mic that will get nice and close. Using the right settings in your camera. So turning off that AGC. Making sure you're not using the camera's gain. Making sure that the gain is appropriate for your subject. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, I mean, you should, I think that's like a life lesson in itself, isn't it? Be aware of your surroundings. Um, where you record matters. You know, like I say, so, you know, if you're recording in a wind, in a windy environment, make sure you're using the wind protection. Uh, if you're able to use Lavalier, use Lavalier, etc. cetera. Uh, that feeds into using the right accessories. Um, yeah, make sure you're using the wind protection. Make sure you're using, uh, you're charging uh, your mics, for example, if you've got like a wireless system, make sure it's charged. Uh, the amount of times I've gone to a shoot and one of my shotgun mics has run out of battery. Super annoying. Make sure you press record. I think that's a given. Um, and talking about denoising, editing, EQ, and the such. So I'm just going to give you like a very kind of quick rundown of what a kit bag would look like. Um, if you're going to be uh, doing something out in the field. So generally speaking, I've put Rode products on there, but other microphones are available. They're not as good, but uh, they are <laughs> available. Um, so yeah, generally speaking, like a kit bag for someone like myself that's doing a lot of kind of run and gun and interview and that kind of stuff would uh, consist of a shotgun mic, uh, the windshield for that, little wireless system. Headphones. This is something that people always, always forget. Uh, and a lot of cameras now actually have headphone outputs. Again, that was something kind of 10, 15 years ago when I started filming, didn't really exist. Um, headphones are vitally, vitally important. You can look at those uh, levels in your camera, but how do you know it actually sounds good if you can't hear it? Yeah, you wouldn't even, I didn't even think about mentioning that earlier. It's just struck me now. How are you going to hear it? Headphones, exactly. Um, always good to have a boom pole. 
uh, as well. Uh, we were talking about recording the sources, making sure you can get close enough. Um, Road actually make this mini boom pole that folds down to about this big and it's made of carbon fiber. It weighs absolutely nothing. Um, always carry one of those around with me. Not right now, but when I'm out and about filming. Um, very, 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 very useful. It means that you can get a lot closer to the subject. If you need to get the mic a lot closer and you need to keep it out of shot, boom poles are super, super useful for that. And I've, I've got something on kind of misconnectors. Um, make sure you've got the right cables. Uh, make sure you've got the right thread adapters because rather annoyingly, there's not a standard for the uh, threads in the bottom of microphones. So road mics will go on the hot shoe of your camera, but they'll also go on the end of a boom pole. Uh, even within the road catalog, we have not standardized the size of the thread adapter. Uh, so it's very, very important that you carry some spares. Uh, we make some, but you can buy bags of them from anywhere. Um, that you absolutely carry as many of them around with you as you can. Um, so that is it. Have you got any questions for me um, regarding audio or anything else? You can ask me absolutely anything. Even if it's about road products, I'm super easy. But if we haven't got any questions, no? Good. Thank you, everyone. I've been Tom. See you later.